Welcome to Startups Uncensored number 36 with SurveyMonkey CEO David Goldberg and DocStock CEO Jason Nazar. Please join me in welcoming the CEO, <laughs> badass superstar, <laughs> Dave Goldberg. I feel, like, I feel like I'm at a rally here. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jason. All right, Dave, we're going to do something new. I don't, know, I, I don't know where I came up with this, but I think I'm going to give you this drink here. We got a little Jack and Diet. Oh, Jesus. All right? For those who know, we need, a, we need a word that's a drink word. What's our drink word tonight? Deal. Deal? We're gonna do. We're gonna. I don't, we're like. <laughs> yeah. We were actually supposed to have 50 live monkeys here, uh, but when they got we tested sick. it, there was a lot of feces on the wall. Some limbs got ripped off of small, floor people. All right, so let's jump in. Um, you hold on to your drink. We're gonna keep it by the side. We'll figure out something that we're gonna right, have to drink right. up through the night. There's water um, there too, in case I needed to chase. Them. Yes. Yeah. So Dave, thank you for coming down to joining us. Um, just by show of hands, let's, get it, let's poll the audience. You're pretty good at polling. Let's, yep. just, let's monkey survey them up a little bit. Yep. Um, how many of you right now are running or plan to start your own business in the next three months? Show of hands. All right. So you can see we got a good That's third great. to half yeah, of the yeah. room. That's great. How many of you right now are in the process of uh, fundraising or are going to be looking to fundraise? All right. How many of you have or are currently, in some capacity, using SurveyMonkey. Whoa! That is. We got some work cool. to do, though. I think. We yeah, got we got some signs doing it. That's good. Anything though, yeah. we can give out here? Yeah, that's good. That's good. All right. All right. Um, yeah. So that gives us a bit of sense, yeah. and we're going to jump in. What I'd love to just kind of know a little bit is why don't we start off with a little bit of your background? You know, what was sure. the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey and path? <laughs> uh, well, my, my brother's here, so he can uh, he can he can. Uh, uh, tell if I'm telling the truth here. Um, so I, I was not a entrepreneur that was one of those people that started their first lemonade stand when they were 12 and always wanted to run their own business. It was not something for me where I always knew I wanted to run my own business. Uh, I really decided that it was something I wanted to do six months before I did it. Um, which, by the way, you should have a little more time there. Uh, but um, I, uh, I was living here, so I actually most of my work career I spent in LA, so it's kind of like a nice homecoming to be, be here. Um, and I was working at Capitol Records in Hollywood, and uh, I, I, I kind of got- How old are you right now? Uh, at the time, how old are you? 25. Um, and I got to this place where I, I just knew I needed to try running something, and they weren't gonna let me run Capitol Records for at least another 15 years. <laughs> And I was going to go insane in 15 years if I was going to stay at a record company. And there were some great people there, but record companies, as we've now all discovered, are really badly run. They were badly run back then. They just made a lot of money. Um, and so, um, and I just, I wanted, to, I wanted to try running something, and they, no one was going to let me. No one was going to, if someone had given me a business to run back then, I wouldn't have started my own. What was the desire? I mean, you're 25 years old. Where did that desire to run something come from? I'm not good working for people. I think that's kind of, I mean, you, and you learn stuff about yourself. And uh, I, I worked at Bain, this management consulting firm, before I worked at Capital. And one of the people there said to me, and they meant this as a negative. I thought it was quite a compliment. But they're like, you'd make a much better partner than you make an analyst. And I thought, that's good. They thought that was bad. <laughs> they needed an analyst. I was trying to be the partner. Um, so, um, uh, you know, so that, um, and it's not that I haven't worked for some great people, but it's just, it's not kind of in my nature to sort of, I, I, I think I'm, I'm a, a pretty good team member. I think I'm a pretty good leader of people. Um, I'm not a very good person to manage. Okay, so can you, can you talk about that a little more? Because I think a lot of us in the room feel the same way. Like we got into entrepreneurship because it's like we just didn't want to. Where does like what does that really mean? Does it just mean you, you don't want to take orders from anybody that you think you can do it better? Yeah, you get. I think you get frustrated by all the lost opportunities that you see, and you you spend. I mean, you spend a lot of your time trying to convince somebody else to do something. And you think, well, this would be so much easier if I could just do it myself. And um, I had this experience when I was at Capital. So I got hired. I worked for the president and general manager of the label. 
And so I had a lot of influence because I, even though I was young, I was kind of, I got to talk to the guys who did make all the decisions. Um, and they listened to me sometimes and they didn't listen to me other times, but um, they got fired about a year and a half into my being there. And the new guy got hired, who's also a great guy and, and a good friend of mine still. Um, but there was a, he had to wait before he could start. So we had like a three month period where no one was running anything. And that was the best three months, because I just got to go do all the stuff that no one would let me do before, and no one was gonna let me do once he started again. And that was the moment in time where I realized, like, I gotta go do my own thing. And so the new guy came in, really great guy, some of you may know him, Gary Gersh, a really successful guy, and did a great job. But, uh, you know, I, I said, Gary, I, you know, six months in, I, I just said, it's not you, it's me, I gotta go, and I have this idea, and I wanna go do this thing. So you broke up with him. It's not, it's, not, know, it's not you, you it's, me. it's me. It's me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mazel tov. Uh, uh, so where do, you go, where do you go from there? So um, I, uh, I had the, so I knew I wanted to leave, and then I didn't know what I was going to go do. And I had a couple of my friends, and I think what you guys are doing here is absolutely the most critical thing. Like the best place to sort of bounce ideas off people. You, you know, there's no, you can't go to business school to learn to be an entrepreneur. You, you, you only can do it. And so the best way to learn about it is just to talk to other people who have done it and are doing it. In fact, are doing it is probably even more valuable. I'm not sure I'm that valuable to you at this point in time, but I think talking to people who are going through the same things you're going through at that moment in time is critical. So I started talking to a bunch of people. One of my really good friends um, was an agent at, uh, at ICM at the time, and he was like, same thing, I gotta go make movies. I don't want to be an agent. And so we started talking about how we could work together. And there really wasn't a good reason for us. What I wanted to do wasn't what he wanted to do. But it just was like inspiring to find somebody who also wanted to go start their own thing. And I didn't really know anybody at, in 1993 who'd ever started a business before. I literally don't think I knew anybody. I don't believe people started businesses in 1993. <laughs> well, they did. But it, wasn't, it, was, it was not that common. Um, and so anyway, so. Um, and I got inspired by um, other people who had started businesses. I read books. I read a book about Bill Gates. I read a book um, called The Republic of Tea, which is not a particularly well-known book, but um, they make great tea. Um, and, but the book was really cool, because the book told the story of how these two guys came up with the idea for this business and started it. And they actually funded the business with the proceeds from the book. And so it was this kind of cool, so you actually were like helping them with their business, find the book. But it was for me, it was like, oh, wow, this is how you start a business. And so anyway, I came up with this idea, um, a lot of stuff I was doing to Capital about how um, the computer was gonna be another way for people to learn about music. So again, if you flash back to 1993, um, people are just starting to buy more CDs than cassettes. Um, MTV is still playing music videos. And uh, uh, you know, Top 40 is bigger than K-Rock in terms of you know, music, Kiss FM or something, which I'm not even sure exists anymore, but uh, maybe it does. But, um, um, and so, but I saw all these problems in the music business. We had all these great artists, and we couldn't get them through that funnel of the music videos and internet radio promotion channel. And I saw what was happening to the computer. The computers were adding audio and video, and I thought, well, if we could get people to the computer to listen to music and discover music, that was going to be another outlet. And the computer was going to be better than radio and MTV because you could listen to stuff you wanted without having to hear the stuff you didn't want. And at the end of the day, music is really personal. Everybody likes music, and nobody likes anybody else's. It's, it's very, you'll very rarely find people who you know, will sit through uh, exactly the same music if they have a choice. Everyone likes something slightly different. People like some music the same, but they will like slightly different stuff. And so that was the idea. Um, it, it wouldn't go away. Um, I shared it with my best friend from high school, a guy named Bob Roback, um, who was a lawyer at the time in Chicago. And he got really excited about it, and he wasn't really enjoying being a lawyer. And um, uh, I quit my job at the end of 93, and he quit his job. And we started in my apartment in Santa Monica um, uh, two weeks before the Northridge earthquake, um, which I would not advise, uh, but we didn't know it was coming. <laughs> Um, no, do not start a business before an earthquake. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Perhaps tweet uh, that out as a uh, pearl of wisdom. Uh, we were getting seasick on the 15th floor, which is where my apartment was. Um, but uh, 
Um, and we, didn't, we really didn't know what we were doing, except we knew this was a really big opportunity, um, that um, there was going to be a way to get. I had done a deal um, when I was at Capitol to put the first music on a real music on a video game, because the Sega CD had come out. And that was the first CD platform for games. Before that, they were just cartridges. And so there was enough storage and enough quality to put music on there. And so you just saw all this stuff happening. But it was still really early. There was certainly no internet delivery of music at that point in time. Um, but we had this idea. And we, we said, you know, we're going to start with CD-ROM, because that was a way we could get music to people um, and video. And we could um, get them the ability to choose what they wanted to hear. Um, and we could wrap it with advertising and make a media business out of it. And so we started, uh, it was, was called Launch, um, and some of you may have heard of it. I've got a few of my old uh, colleagues back here. Uh, former colleagues, not old. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and um, I, by the way, I, I don't write code. So one of my big challenges and I'm sure this is the case for some people in this room, is I'm building a product where I need someone to write the code. And my partner was a lawyer, so he didn't write code. And so we didn't have anyone to write the code. Um, so we had to go find developers. We went through a bunch of hassles. And it wasn't nearly as easy to find developers, particularly in LA at that point in time. But we did find some it's people. It's super easy in LA now yeah, to find yeah. developers. <laughs> Yeah. There, there was really a handful. You just go to bars and they're hanging yeah. out. And you take them home <laughs> yeah. at night and well, you roofie them and make them work for you. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so we uh, we managed to do that, and we we didn't have any money either. So I I'm sure all of you have lots of funding, so it's not a problem. Um, <laughs> but um, we didn't have any money, uh, and uh, so um, we raised $100,000 from our friends and family off a written business plan. No one does that anymore. Um, but those are the only people who are crazy enough to give you money when you've never done anything before and all you have is a business plan. Um, and those are the people whose money you least want to lose. But after I raised that money in $10,000 increments from my friends, um, I then tried to talk them out of it. I was like, OK, thank you. Now here's why you shouldn't do this, because you're never going to see this money again. And um, I wasn't that good at talking them out of it once I talked them into it. And so well, I talked a few out of it. But, uh, but we managed to raise that money. We put some of our own money in. We borrowed money on credit cards. And we built a prototype, because that's, that's all we could afford. Um, and then with that prototype, we were able to raise some more money um, and eventually uh, some venture funding um, and start really building the business and hiring people. How much did you raise that next round after you had the prototype? Uh, like 650. And, then, and, and was it the prototype was that good, or did you learn something in between that first real friends and family round, which was really personal, versus, hey, I'm now raising over a half a million dollars? Um, the, uh, the prototype proved to people that, like, wow, you could actually create a compelling experience on the computer. And we were able to show it to people. And we were actually, and this is really crazy, so this is 1994. So there's no Netscape browser. There's no. Um, and there's no banner ads. Um, and we were showing people you know, this music and video and interviews. We had an interview with the band Dada. That was our prototype that we used. And my friend Jay Boberg at IRS Records like, convinced the band to do this, even though it was not going to amount to anything. And, uh, and we had ads. And we'd just taken some ads and created some stuff. And we were able to, off that prototype, get um, what's now Starcom Media, but was Leo Burnett in Chicago, um, to commit to th three of their advertisers to advertising in our so first. So you were just straight hustling to make this happen. Yeah, we got Sony Electronics to agree to distribute the CDs when we came out with them. We got a bunch of people committing to us off this prototype, which was crazy. So let, let's veer off the story path for a second, because I want to I want to do round. So the first business, you raised $100,000. How old are you? 26. 26. Uh, in ten thousand dollar increments. Then later on, after you build the product, you raise six hundred fifty thousand. Then you raised how much venture for that business? Uh, well, I mean, subsequent rounds. I mean, you know, I think was three million dollars, and then six million dollars, and then twenty million dollars, and then we went public. Yeah. So, and then the next, the next 
company, that you, the next opportunity you had to raise money was at SurveyMonkey, right? Yeah. You didn't raise any money between. Right. How many rounds have you done at SurveyMonkey now? Well, SurveyMonkey is super different. I mean, Sur SurveyMonkey is the ultimate lean startup, um, and it was founded by one guy, and he never we'll, raised We'll definitely money. get that. I'm just, trying to pay, I'm just trying to show how much money you've actually raised. Oh, how right? much money you've actually raised. Uh, so the first SurveyMonkey deal uh, was around 175 million, and then we did some more debt financing, you know, which was refinancing some of our other stuff, but call it another incremental 100 million. And, and then, then most recently, and then we just raised 800 million of debt and equity. All right, so you you have raised more money than we will all collectively see in this room. <laughs> <laughs> and our, no, I'm sure they all will. All right, let's let's just talk about that for a second. What I mean. With SurveyMonkey, you came in a situation where the product was growing and you helped it grow infinitely. But what, what is the secret of that success? I mean, you didn't start off in this magical place. You, didn't, you weren't born with a silver spoon, right? You didn't have any money yourself. The first round you raised was $100,000, which is less than what a lot of the folks here have you raised. Over 10 rounds, what are the most important things you've learned about raising money, how to get the deal done, and, and how actually to be successful at that? Yeah, I mean, I think, so in my first company, like, every time I thought I'd figured out how to raise financing, and I'd like, all right, I didn't do this, this one very well, but now I've learned, and the next one I'm going to do better. Turns out the next round was totally different. So this is a different group of funders in a different stage, and I'm like, wow, I really screwed that one up too. So uh, there's, there was no recipe for the first time of doing it right. Um, uh, the second time, though, I've kind of learned a lot about financing and um, a whole bunch of things. And, uh, and also, I have a lot more credibility. So it's just easier than being the 26-year-old kid trying so to convince what, people. What things. are some of the key things at each of those stages, right? And, and those early angel yeah. rounds, and then your first VC round, and later and larger rounds, like, what are the most important things you have learned? Um, I think the most important thing I have learned is to um, you have to be able to modify some things you're doing, but you have to have conviction about the core. And even if everybody tells you you're wrong, you know, you might be wrong and you won't ever get it off the ground, but if you change your mind about what you're, you're really trying to do to appease a funder, you're going to get yourself in, in a bad place. And, um, you know, we took some strategic investors' money because some of our other investors told us to do it, and then those strategic investors drove us crazy and sort of delayed us from actually doing what we should have been doing. And I just came to regret, you know, taking money from some of these people because it really sort of screwed up our path. So it wasn't actually the funding process. It was actually I got the wrong investors as part of that process. Can and you so, talk about that? Because I think sometimes we're all in situations where we're so, you know, desperate just to get yeah. to the next milestone. It's like, look, it's like you're drowning. You just kind of hang on yeah. anything. I, I, but that's, that's how I was. I mean, we were a bunch of times like we were out of money in the bank account. And I had 30 employees or 50 employees, and like I was putting stuff on my credit cards and not paying myself and all those sort of things to just kind of hang on so we can get the next round. And so it's like at the time, I was like, yeah, I'll take that guy's money because I need it. And, and what, but, what are you feeling at that time? At the time that you built a business up to that scale and, you, and you're literally, you know, having to finance it on your credit cards, I mean, like, what are you going through mentally? Well, I think the first 18 months when it was just my partner and I, and we didn't really have any employees, like, that part well, was well, maybe 12 months. That part wasn't that scary. Because like we could just go get a job. We'd lost our friends and family money. We'd lost the money we'd put in. We'd just go get a job. <laughs> but when you start hiring people who actually quit other jobs to come work for you, and they're expecting to get paid every week, and you fail them, that's when I felt pressure. I didn't feel pressure quitting my job, starting a business. I felt pressure when I hired those people. And then it was like, holy cow, I have to make this work because I don't want to let those people down. And so that's when it was kind of scary. Um, and you just, you find a way. I mean, I think that's, that's what entrepreneurs do. It's like you find a way. I mean, other entrepreneurs help me. So, so to me, the golden rule of entrepreneurs is lots of people who helped me along the way had no reason to help me, but they did, and they were really instrumental. And like, so, you know, my view is, you know, I've done pretty well. My goal is, you know, I need to do that for other people too. I can't do it for everybody, but I need to do it for people. I try to do it for people that I know, you know, um, and, and, and that I think is really important. But that was the thing that saved me. And then the thing that motivates you is all these people who told you no, this is a stupid idea, this will never work, and then proving them wrong. 
and that's really motivating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but you, you. I'm sure you've had that, right? I mean, I'm sure um, people have said that's actually is... how I got engaged. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much what happened. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, so I, I, I think um, you gotta, you gotta, you know, I don't think there's any magic bullet to finding your way. What was uh, the hardest round? Which one was the hardest round of capital to raise? <sighs> Apparently not the friends and family because you're trying to get them to take the money back. No, yeah, the friends and family was fairly easy. Um, so I'll, I'll tell the story. Um, it, it was um, really hard to raise that 650. Um, everyone said, you guys can't write code. Your partner's a lawyer. Why don't you ditch him and get another person? Um, you, uh, no one, uh, people told me no one are, no one's ever going to watch advertising on a computer. No one's ever going to watch, I know, but that's what people say. People say, people are going to say stuff to you with the same kind of conviction that people said that stuff to me back then. Um, there's never going to be enough CD-ROM drives. I mean, all sorts of stuff people said to me. Um, I, I, you think I forgot those? Okay. Um, so, um, and then we met with this guy and he was young and he sort of got it and he wrote us a check on the spot for half a million dollars. And I thought I'd won the lottery um, because I'd been, I was really kind of getting pretty, pretty. How many folks had you pitched up until that point? Well, I don't know, 30, 35 people. Some great people, some people now that I'm quite good friends with. Jim Breyer at Excel turned me down very nicely. Mike Moritz at Sequoia turned me down very nicely. Um, a lot of really smart people turned me down very nicely. Um, and, uh, uh, um, and then some of those people, you know, came back to me a couple years later and said, you know, I was wrong. Can I invest now? And it, we'd sort of passed where they could sort of enter. Um, so people, people know that they, they, they make mistakes, too. Um, but um, anyway, we took this money from this venture firm, and the, the, the guy we worked with was great. Um, his father, who was the other partner in the venture firm, was very much the old school um, investor. And what we didn't realize at the time was that no one else really wanted to work with him. <laughs> And so we took their money, and then we went to go raise our real Series A. We couldn't do it because no one wanted to be in a deal with the father. The son was a great guy. No one wanted to be in a deal with the father. And so we had to take the A from them. And so the, the, the 500000 was like kind of a poison pill. It came very easy. The Series A came with all the really ugly stuff. And so, you know, you can't learn those things until you've done it. Now I'm never going to do that again, obviously. But, but, um, but you, you know, you, there's, no one tells you that stuff. No one says. So if anyone has a father, you won't let them invest in your company. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 you know, I, I think uh, you just have to, some things that look really good and easy yeah. uh, aren't. Um, so can, can you talk about, so you're 27 years old when you start launch, right? 27 or 26. 26. Yeah. Um, and in how long did it take you to get to a public company? Uh, it took five years to go public. And at, and at the height of it, right before you go public, how many employees do you have? I think we had about, I don't know, 80, 80, 90, I don't know. Charlene and Rob probably, it's something, something about 80 or 90 people. We were hiring people fast. Yeah. Like the last couple, I mean, it was like, we're going public. You want to join before we go? Like it was, we were hiring people fast. So about, about 80 or 90 people. What, what, are, what were the most important lessons you learned during that time? What did you learn about business? What did you learn about management? I mean, here you are, and it's you and your partner working by yourself. You're 26 years old, and now all of a sudden you have almost 100 people reporting yeah. into you. What are, the things you. what are the things that you had challenged with, and what are the things you learned during that time? I mean, I think, so... So I'll just step back and say for a second, like one of the things that I, I learned that like, like I said, kind of stick to your core in certain things. Like I didn't have a conviction about going public or not going public. Um, I had this vague feeling that I didn't really want to go public, but I didn't, I didn't have a lot of conviction. And I had all these investors and saying, this is what you do. This is the next round of capital. This is, this is you know, how, we, how we build a really big business is go public. And I wasn't that excited about it. It wasn't like, again, I didn't start my business to go public. Um, uh, but it did seem like, okay, well, that's the next fundraising event, and so we should do it. And I probably should have pushed back harder. 
and said, do we really need to go public? We have enough cash. We're doing pretty well. We went public in early 99. Um, because we actually, unlike a lot of companies that went public later in 99, 2000, we actually had real revenue. Um, we had customers, uh, we had advertisers, uh, we had about 10 million in revenue. We weren't profitable, but you could see how it was gonna work. Um, so, and, and then I think um, once you go public, and particularly in that period of time, and those of you that remember, there was this mad rush to grow revenue as quickly as possible, and it was not about how many people you hired or you know, how much expenses you had, or, and, and so it felt vaguely like this is, doesn't make any sense, and the people who are telling you this don't know what they're doing, but it was hard to fight everybody else's sort of inertia. And we did fight some things. So, for, for example, one of the things people told us in 99 when we went public, remember, we are a, at this point now online as well, we had still the CD-ROM, but we were online, online music videos, internet radio, interviews with bands, that kind of stuff. Everyone was telling us, you guys should get out of the ad space and sell CDs, because e-commerce is where all the money is. Why don't you sell CDs? And I kept saying to people, literally on the road show, every, all the questions were, why aren't you selling CDs? Why don't you go compete with Amazon? Blah, blah. And I said, it's not a business. No one makes any money selling CDs. Why would I want to sell them online? No one makes any money in the store. There's no money online. Like the, and, so those things we stuck to, but some of the other stuff where we, we sort of fell into the same thing where it's like, oh, we gotta grow revenue as quick as possible and spend money and not try to get to profitability quickly. Like we got caught up in some of that stuff too. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, I think we made some mistakes on the IPO and the financing and the way we did it. And, you what know, were the mistakes you made? Um, we, I mean, it's, some of it's more technical. But um, we had a very successful IPO. We got 75, I had 75 one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, in 17 days. Uh, the IPO process is not, not, not one designed for uh, fun. Um, anyway, uh, and we got 75 orders from those 75 meetings, 100% hit rate. But some of the people I was in the meetings with were absolutely hated the business. But they still put an order in anyway. And I thought, well, maybe they changed their mind or whatever. You know, the banker's like, oh, this is great. You guys really nailed it. And it turns out that's not the case. And you don't want those people in your deal because they're going to sell out right away. They just know the stock's going to do well, and they're going to flip out. And in a small public company, you need a large, you know, small base of large holders. You don't need a large base of small holders. None of them are going to hold it. And some of our real, the, the people who did really believe in us investors, they got a tiny allocation. And so they were frustrated too, so they, they didn't stay in. And so we ended up with this um, fairly good initial offering, but then a very uh, unstable shareholder base. And so I had to then spend the next year rebuilding that shareholder base to get the right investors were you, in. Were you personally able to get liquidity in the public markets before things kind of took a nosedive? No. No. no, no one, back then, no one got liquidity before you went public. No one got liquidity when you were public. Like you just, you know, you had to be, really successful and then you could sell. So no, I, in fact, I bought more of my own stock when it was public um, and, you know. But what, what happened to the stock after, in, in, in early 2000? So I got the stock price back up over what we went public at because the stock had traded down as I had the shareholder problem. The company was doing fine, um, but, but the, we had this shareholder issue. And then in March of 2000, everything, you know, that was the peak and then everything started falling and ours started falling along with it. And uh, at that point, I was like, I, I'm like, I'm not doing this again. I'm not rebuilding shareholder base. So we decided at that point, we didn't want to be public. And we worked on starting to sell the company. And we had our, our first meeting actually with Yahoo in March of 2000. Um, and they were distracted. As, I, I learned this later after they bought us, but they didn't tell us at the time. They were distracted because they had eBay in the other room. And it was like, eBay or launch? You know, I was like, where are they going to spend your time? So they, were, they, they just like, we can't focus on you guys right now. Um, so anyway, we went through a sale process, and it was very difficult because everyone's stock prices were diving. You, you think, oh, when things get cheaper, people buy more things. But it's not that case in, in buying companies. In fact, um, it's exactly the opposite. People buy things when prices are really expensive, and they're going up because people are like, well, they're going to keep going up, so I want to buy it now before it gets more expensive. And that's true with private companies and public companies. Um, so um, anyway, we... We eventually did sell the company to Yahoo in June of 2001. So it took over a year. Um, and at that point in time, the stock price had dropped uh, pretty precipitously. Um, I think our stock was down 91% from March of 2000, and Yahoo's was down 93%. 
Um, so how, I mean, how much money did you lose because of all that? I mean, literally, was it like a five? It was all on sentence? paper. I mean, it was, you know, I never had the money. Um, so, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, and I didn't, I had done a lot of dilution. I didn't own that much of the company um, at that point in time. So, I mean, it was, it was a substantial amount to me on paper. Um, but it wasn't, it was never real. Um, and, um, uh, and it wasn't, I, I, it wasn't about the money for me. It's never been about the money. It's about, um, you know, I really became passionate that we were changing the way people were going to learn about music. How did you feel at the end of that process, at the end of a six-year journey starting this company from nothing but an idea and your gut and your, and your hustle and to seeing it all the way through? Did you feel satisfied, vindicated, tired? Like, what were you feeling at the end of all of it? Um, I think I was excited that we were ending up at Yahoo because I felt Yahoo was the right place for us. And we had some other bidders. And we would have sold it to whoever was the highest bidder. Um, ironically, we got sued by the record companies on the day the final bids were due. And the other two bidders dropped out. And Yahoo actually got a really great deal because our stock price dropped and they were the only bidder. Um, which was very unfortunate for you know, our shareholders and obviously for me financially, but it ended up being the right thing for the business and for my team. And I'm really glad for my team and for the business that we ended up at Yahoo, okay. because we were able to kind of then grow the business at Yahoo. So it, it things work out. So again, along the way, what are the what were the what are the biggest things that you learned, and what are the biggest challenges you had with management? You go from being a mid twenty year old by yourself to you know thirty year old managing hundred people. What are the biggest things that you learned in that time? Yeah, I think. Um, you learn, first of all, like to surround yourself with people who are more talented than you are. Like I think that's the my my number one rule, is like you just gotta hire people who are smarter than you and more talented, and and that doesn't always mean they're more experienced. Sometimes they're less experienced, but they're just more talented. And and also, I think it's about building a great team. And people say that all the time, but I mean it in the way like of a football team and that there's a lot of different players that you need to sort of round out a good team. And you need kickers, and you need quarterbacks, and you need, you, need, you, need, you need lots of different people with different experiences and different skill sets to make it all work. Um, and you can't hire all people who have a lot of experience, and you can't hire all people who have no experience. You've got to have a mixture of those things. But it took a while to sort of sort that stuff out. And I thought, wow, I've got to hire a really experienced ad salesperson because I don't know anything about ad sales, and that's my whole business. And I heard someone, and it wasn't the right person. And then I waited too long to fire that person. Right? When, you're, when you're hiring, how do you know, like, what questions do you ask, and how do you get that good feeling? It's like, this is a good person, or how do you know when something's wrong? So I think I'm skeptical about interviews in general, that, I, I, that you can really, I think you can reject someone easily in an interview. Like, if you really don't click with that person, don't like them, it's pretty easy to say no. But a lot of times, we get a lot of false positives in an interview. that. We like the person, you know, particularly salespeople, because they're great at selling, and they sell you, they sell themselves, they're, they're salespeople. Um, uh, so I'm not, I don't believe you can really tell in the interview. I think it's really about great references, and I don't mean calling their references. I mean, it's, they were referred by somebody you know and trust. You got someone to talk to you and tell you the truth, and it's very hard to do that stuff, but, you know, with, Senior hires, like it's sort of a requirement. Like we don't get that reference from somebody today at Survey Monkey. We, we don't hire the person. Um, I probably ninety percent of our sort of senior team was one degree of separation from me or somebody else on that team. So there's just you know you just and, and you don't want everyone to be the same, but you need you need that. I, I think my my best interview question. I don't know if this is the best one, but I I, I force people to tell me stuff they're bad at. Because how do, you, how do you phrase the question? Do you phrase it just like that? Tell me stuff you're bad at? Tell me stuff you don't like to do. Tell me things you're not good at. Tell me stuff you're, you, you, you wish you didn't have to do. And I just keep pushing at that until I get somebody to tell me the truth. And when people tell me like, something that like, sounds like they're bad at, but it's they're really something they're good at, like, I don't like that. Like, that's not being honest. We're all bad at stuff. I'm bad at lots of things. What I'll tell you, you what all What are you bad things. at? Oh, my god. Well, my brother could just go on for hey, Rob, hours. Hey, Rob, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. what, where, where does he start? What are you um, bad at? What am I bad at? I mean, um, I'm not a detail person. Right? I'm just, I'm not a detail person. My partner, Bob, he was a detail person. Right? I like to find people who are 
better than I am and or compliment me and other things. So like Bob's a real detail person. And you know, that's really important. You need details, you need process and those things. That's not me. I'm good at other things, but I'm not good at that stuff. And so what I What else need... are you bad at? What else am I bad at? <laughs> that's like the easy answer, detail. It's like, I mean it's kind of like what you're saying. Well, I, I, I go on forever. Every entrepreneur is bad at details. Um no, I think I think some people are really into details. Yeah, they're um, lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's a lot of other people. I mean, um, I think um, I probably, you know, I'm I've gotten better at this, but I'm never going to be good at it. I, I'm I'm not particularly patient and tolerant. I think that's true with a lot of entrepreneurs. And I think sometimes being patient, tolerant is important. Sometimes it's not. But I think, you know, being under as you get older, hopefully you get a little bit wiser and you understand where it's okay to be impatient and where it's not. I think when I was younger, I was like impatient all the time. And, and I think that, that, that's not productive and it's not helpful. Out, outside of um, your immediate family, who, who, are the, who are the business leaders today that you look to and say, wow, they, they've just got it down. I, I wish I could be more like them or really respect how they're running a business. I mean, I think there's a lot of people. I think. Again, I think there's pieces of all of those people you'd say they're not perfect. They're not, you know, they have flaws and things. But boy, I wish I could do things as well. I mean, I, you know, Jeff Bezos, I think, uh, just has done an incredible job over time of being um, able to transition his team and his company into so many different things and yet not lose focus. How does he do that? Because that always amazes me, right? I mean. How does, how does he take a company that goes from selling books to now providing cloud services and devices and, and everything in between and, my God, mechanical turf, so, right? So, what, what I mean, I don't know the details. I don't, I don't know Jeff very well. I've met him a few times, but I don't, certainly don't pretend to know him or anything. Um, but I, what I think, I think what I know of it is that um, Jeff hires really good people and he trusts them and he lets them go do that stuff. And those businesses that were started were started by people internally who had some good ideas and he said, go figure it out and he let them go do it. And so he lets people be entrepreneurs inside of Amazon. And that, people talk about that stuff all the time, but it's very hard to do. It's hard for me to do inside of SurveyMonkey. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to do because you're trying to get everyone rowing in one direction and then somebody's off here doing this completely other thing and it's distracting and it's taking resources and everyone tells you focus, 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 and then, but you've got this other thing going on over here. And so being able to manage that correctly, I think lots of companies would like to do it. Very few have been successful at that. Um, there's, there's very, you know, companies we typically think of as innovative. When you really look at their innovation, it's usually one product that they've iterated on and expanded on. So what I think is unique about Amazon is, like you said, they were innovative in books and mm -hmm. e-commerce, but they've also been really innovative in cloud services and now online video and book publishing, like really disparate things, and they've actually been pretty successful at it. So. That, that's, I think, pretty unique. So let's jump to SurveyMonkey. Um, we'll actually start in the present. We can go backwards. You didn't start SurveyMonkey. It had, what, a five-year head start? Uh, uh, Longer? Nine. Nine-year head start. Really a slow burn product, right? They put yes. it out there, just kind of kept getting customers. Uh, talk about what the business is today, and, and just to give a sense of scale. Like, yeah. For example, I think you said you publicly disclosed this. Yeah. Revenue lump numbers for last year? Yeah, revenue last year was $113 million. We did $61 million of EBITDA last year. Um, Which is amazing. <laughs> Incredible, <laughs> yeah. right? We What's had, the headcount? Uh, today, I think we're about 230 people. And you don't, and so that's, and you don't even really do that much paid advertising and marketing. The product... Yeah. Has become really viral, naturally adopted. Yeah. It's something like eighty to ninety percent. Yeah, we get over we get you know sixty five million completed surveys a month um, from people all over the world. And when people take those surveys, they learn about SurveyMonkey. Our brand is embedded in the surveys. You see our thank you page at the end, and it's not directly viral. It's not like everyone who takes those surveys then rushes to sign up and create their own <laughs> surveys. It's not you know you wish it was that way, but it's not. Um, but people learn about us, and then when they think, uh, you know, I need a survey for something, they, they remember the name. You know, one of 
main things, people direct typing in SurveyMonkey into their browser or searching for it in Google. Monkey Survey, they remembered that. Like you think the name's kind of funny, but it turns out the name was really important because it helped people when they went back to it to remember it. It's kind of a silly name, but it, it, it works for people to remember it. Um, and those- You started like a whole group of, you know, MailChimp. I think you're like the grandfather yeah, no, of the- Yeah, there's a whole bunch chimp, of those. Ape. Yeah, tech family, aren't you? Yeah, Hootsuite, you know, <laughs> Owl. Um, yeah, um, but it, but it, you know, you want people to remember it in a what we are and that people have used different terms for the types of businesses we are: consumer, uh, sorry, business freemium, uh, self-service SaaS. I've heard all sorts of crazy words, but in this consumerization of the enterprise, which is what SurveyMonkey is and was the first one of the first apps in that space. Um, you know, having a name people remember, having a product that's really easy to use, having a free product. Um, so people talk about freemium a lot of times, and whether it's a consumer or business, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the real trick is having a free product that's actually useful to people. People think, oh, I'll just disable the free product so everyone buys my paper. It doesn't work like that. You actually need lots of people using your free product, and you guys know this as well. You need people using the free product and liking the free product. And then some of those people will pay you, but most people will never pay you. But they still like you, and they will tell other people about it, and they will spread your name and your word to somebody who will then pay you. And since you didn't cost you anything to service those people, it's actually, it works pretty well. You can't have a freemium business where there's a really uh, large cost of goods. It, that doesn't work. But, um, you know, it's, SurveyMonkey is super powerful because it just grew and grew over time. I mean, it was started by one guy named Ryan Finley in his apartment in Wisconsin. He never raised any money. He had his brother helping him with customer support. The first five years, it was literally just them. It was kind of the ultimate lean startup. And they were making a couple million dollars in revenue, and they were super profitable. And he had to hire his first employee, and so they moved to Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, they moved from Madison, Wisconsin to, uh, to, to Portland, Oregon, because it was warmer, but it was cheaper than the Bay Area. <laughs> Uh, and they hired a few more people, but in 2008, Ryan decided the business could be a lot bigger. He didn't know how to do it. Um, it was 12 people at that point in time, seven of whom were customer support, um, Ryan, his brother Chris, and a couple developers, and that was the whole company. Um, the business had 90% EBITDA margins and was growing 30% a year, so it wasn't broken. He didn't need to sell, and no one was making him sell. He, he and his brother owned the whole company, um, but he just knew it could be bigger, and I mean, I think, I'm just very fortunate to have inherited what Ryan and Chris built, um, and, and, how and much it capital not screwed was it up. In? I mean, I, that's sort of my paramount rule of SurveyMonkey is don't break something that's not broken. How much capital was put in when you came in and started professionally managing it? Um, I don't know that we've just effectively disclosed it, but you know, it was um, uh, we bought control, and you know, it was in the um, uh, combination of debt and equity, but you know. Uh, over a hundred million dollars went in, um, uh, but it was all it was all going to the founders. It didn't go into the business. I started on day one with I think two hundred thousand dollars in the bank you, account. We're gonna have you grab your drink for a second. One thing I just realized: <laughs> we talked a lot about money. I, I've, I've managed to avoid the drink. Yeah, yeah, the drink. <laughs> One thing I realized is um, this side of the room is getting to look at you and this really engaging tweet wall, and this side of the room has to just look at me, which is kind of messed up. If I'm, I'm if trying I'm to look that over side of the room, sometimes. so you and I are going to switch sides all for right. a second, oh, good. so all that right. you all get to see Dave. All right, good. Um, which is a lot nicer than having to I get stuck to drink this. We're going to take a drink because okay. we got it from moved around. Right. We really need. I think what we're going to do with this instead is if I make a joke and nobody laughs, we're going to drink. <laughs> Forget the word. I'm really going to try to lay it on thick because right. I want you to be hammered. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is a new one for me. I've never, I've never never, had Jack and Diet Coke while I'm talking on stage. So that's, that's, we're just, that's definitely a new one. We're just going to keep this up here handy because <laughs> as we know, my jokes. Take a drink. Right there. <laughs> Jeez. All right. So, I'm going to need uh, a little laugh-o-meter, you know. Where is, where's SurveyMonkey going? I mean, what's the future for this? How does it become, uh, you know, half a billion dollar a year company in terms of revenue, a billion dollar a year company, yeah. um, what's the plan for the future? Yeah, so I think um, when I started four years ago, Monday actually, four year anniversary, um, uh, I had this small team in Portland and I, I knew we were going to build the, the team in Palo Alto. We left the team in Portland. We've hired a lot more people in Portland actually. Um, and I kind of had three phases for the business. First phase was literally build the team. 
because I couldn't do a whole lot with uh, two engineers. Um, and the second part was um, basically rebuild the technical architecture, the product architecture, keeping what was working. But the, the business worked, but it was, um, it was built like, very much like a startup, right? And it was hard-coded code, and it was you know, 2003 to 2007 um, .NET code, and um, we, we needed to kind of move to the next level in the technical architecture, but we also needed to kind of move the product forward and have the flexibility to do that, and we just didn't have a lot of flexibility on the, on the current business. Like, we couldn't change prices, for example. Um, uh, we couldn't charge other currencies. We couldn't have other languages. A lot of things that we saw were big opportunities. So kind of phase two has been sort of rebuilding the, the product and the platform, um, and we're kind of most of the way through that at this point. And then the, the, the next part is really turning it from a tool into a platform. And a lot of people talk about that stuff, and um, it's hard to do, um, but that's kind of our goal. We've started down that path. We um, kind of in the, in the realm of starting new businesses inside, we started a new business called SurveyMonkey Audience, which um, solved a need for our users um, to um, by respondents, so let's. I say, think it's be really valuable for the audience yeah. here, right? So if you're trying to pull a segment, yeah. So 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 most people to still today to use SurveyMonkey, they survey people they already have a relationship with, a customer, an employee, a parent at a school, etc. But some of our customers said, "Hey, I need a thousand women, 18 to 49, who have smartphones, to tell me about this new thing I'm thinking of building, and where do we get that? Can you help me?" And we couldn't, and so we said, "Okay, we're going to go build this." So we built this thing. It's called SurveyMonkey Audience. And it is fast, easy, low cost, which is kind of the things we built SurveyMonkey on. And we allow you to buy respondents. And those respondents don't get paid, but we make a charitable donation to a charity of the respondent's choice. Um, it's a 50 cent charitable donation. And, um, and um, we built a panel of over half a million people in the last year and a half. What are, what are the popular segments? What are the segments of folks that people are trying to pull? You know, it's everything. I mean, they want really detailed stuff, which we don't always have on these people. But, you know, it is, you know, someone ran something on uh, Ugg Boots the other day. Um, we have people testing ad copy, um, people coming up with names, um, people. Um, what, are the, what are the segments they're trying to capture? Like, you know, is it, so we talked about, you know, people that are in, running in small businesses. Yeah, so small businesses, obviously, um, a lot of times people want to understand you know, is there demand for this new product I'm thinking of, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's certainly a, a use case. Um, we have a, a lot of financial services clients. People want to understand, hey, um, are consumers going to quit Netflix this month? Or are they going to buy the new Samsung Galaxy 4S? And they're making trading decisions based on the data from our, from our thing. And that was not something we ever thought was part of our business, but they kind of found us. And that's sort of the beauty of our platform is people kind of it, find us. It, what are some of the ways that startups can really yeah. leverage SurveyMonkey? What are the, some of the inventive things that you've seen? I mean, again, for this audience, how uh, could they leverage your product you know, to help grow think, their business? Um, you know, people often with startups want to figure out how to name their startup, right? So that's a really simple use case. And you can send your survey around to a bunch of your friends or a bunch of people you know, uh, but it's probably better to pull your customers and get some feedback. And I think naming is hard. Like, people aren't going to say, yeah, I really love that name for some product they don't know, but they will tell you if they hate it. And that's, that's <laughs> sort of the... That's sort of the, the main thing you're looking for when you're doing naming stuff. Um, so I think product fit, you know, um, a, lot of those, a lot of those type of things are things that businesses use. And then people obviously use us, um, uh, the, 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 the non-panel part also for lots of things. And that's surveying your existing customers, right? Um, surveying, uh, people use us to, do, to generate sales leads. Right? You, you know, if you're trying to get in hold of somebody, they won't get back to you, but sometimes sending them a survey and getting them some information that comes out of that survey is a lot more valuable than engaging something to get a sales lead. So with customers, with, with suppliers and vendors, uh, with employees, a big, big part of our use case is, and you, you use it, you said, with your employees, is to get employee feedback. Um, whether that's employee satisfaction, um, Training feedback. We rig our surveys though, so that the surveys come out better. Yeah. <laughs> well, you drink. Know, you drink. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, uh, that's not a joke. We do rig our surveys. Um, <laughs> I'll let that See, one go. You're the last laughing I'll, I'll after. I'll let that one go. Right <laughs> um, uh, so, um, 
performance reviews and 360s, all those kind of internal cases, and events. So an event like this, you can send out a, a pre-event survey, hey, what do you want Dave to talk about? Um, you probably don't want him to talk about surveys or whatever. You know, get feedback before the event. Um, what kind of drink would you like Jason to be drinking? Um, all that kind of stuff ahead of time. How do I get my banned Facebook account reinstated? Exactly. <laughs> I don't know anyone can help you with that. <laughs> um, and, then, uh, and then after the event, we've all gotten post-event surveys. Um, uh, you know, a lot of times we've all been to events where they leave you the paper survey on the chair. And really, when you think about what Survey Monkey is, um, it's about helping people make better decisions with data. Right? That's, that's what we do. And so um, that paper survey on the chair also can help you make better decisions with data, but it's very cumbersome, it's slow, it's expensive, you know, time consuming to tabulate, all those sort of things. So most of our business is replacing paper and pencil, hallway conversations, emails. People use us to schedule conference calls. You know, you're trying to figure out how to get 15 people in time, Well, you send them a survey and they, you know, the one that wins is the, you know, the, the one that works. So that's- and So in, in, in three years from now, how is, how is survey, you know, how is the business dramatically different than what it is today or what major ways have it changed? Um, I think, I, I think we're gonna continue doing what we're doing, but I think you'll see us kind of, um, like I said, more of a platform than just a tool. So adding kind of data, which the panel business is, other, other data sources um, to help people make better decisions. So not just data they collect in their survey, but other data sources that we can help them provide, um, that we can provide, help, help provide them. Um, I think you'll see us more and more. Um, we didn't have the ability to do APIs on our old platform. A lot of people wanted to partner with us. And we just couldn't do it because the platform wouldn't support it. So now, as we've got the new platform, we're doing a lot of API deals. You'll see us integrated with a lot of other people's apps because people want to collect data um, and, and or sort of match the survey data with other data they have in their apps. So we're doing lots of deals. Not we, We've done one with MailChimp. Um, <laughs> but we've done, one with, we've done them with a lot of email service providers, people like Eventbrite. Um, Urban Airship, I think, is up there uh, as uh, one of Burnside's clients. That, you know, we've, we've worked with them. So you'll see us doing more and more API integrations. Got it. Um, and what's the, what for you right now is the absolute most exciting part about the business? What do you, what do you, when you go in every single day, what are you most excited about? What do you most look forward to? Um, well, I think it's just kind of the creativity of the team. Um, we have a big enough team now that we're able to kind of really think. Um, it's not just, wow, we've got to just be so narrowly focused on getting these five things done in sequential order. We can actually work on five or six different things, not 20, but five or six different things in parallel. And that's just super exciting. So today, we actually had a hackathon last night and today. And there was 30 teams competing for prizes and really cool ideas of stuff that people built on our platform in 24 hours. And that's stuff, we were, we've were we been doing hackathons for the last couple of years, but the ability to actually build really great stuff in a very short period of time um, is now possible because we have this new technology stack and platform and, and we're barely scratching the surface. So I'm just excited to be able to exploit all the work we've done building the, the backbone um, to then sort of really do a lot of really creative, interesting things. Got it. Could you, Pat, I'm going to, I have a couple of questions that lean in. I'd love to just, you know, again. <laughs> so how, how many of you write, how many of you are already familiar with the book that um, Dave's wife, Cheryl, wrote, Lean In? All right. So you got a bunch of folks here that still haven't heard of it. Um, your wife, for those of you that don't know, is the COO of Facebook. Um, Some little company. A little company there. Yeah. See, now you would have laughed at my Facebook deleting profile <laughs> joke. You, um, you, you all take a drink. Um, talk, talk about the thesis of this book. Like what, what, and a lot of people already know it, but what was her main point? What was she really trying to get across to women and to everybody else yeah. you know, as far as how to approach the workplace? I mean, I think there's a lot in the book. And I mean, uh, but I think really Cheryl's goal with the book was um, She's just seen that we don't have enough uh, women leaders in all different areas of, um, of the world, whether that's politics or business or nonprofits or whatever, that we don't have enough women leaders. And um, I, I think she made a joke on Jon Stewart, which was, you know, you know, men still run the world, and she didn't think that's going so well. And, uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, 
so, uh, you know, I think, um, I think we've been stuck with um, women at the top of organizations at about 14% for the last 10 years. And it hasn't moved. And so there's a lot of institutional barriers, and she talks about those. But she also has kind of written a book for, to help women think about how they can change their behavior and how they can get their spouses, partners, you know, bosses, et cetera, to change their behavior too. It's not just for women telling them what to do. It's, it's kind of for everybody. Like, how do we sort of together figure out how to get more women into senior leadership roles? And so that's the goal. Um, and um, I, think, um, I think she's doing a lot of really uh, amazing stuff with it. Were you surprised by the reaction? I think it's definitely <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who didn't see, uh, Dave and Cheryl, I think about a month ago, we're now on 60 Minutes. It was absolutely awesome. You can go to 60minutes.com. <laughs> you can see their full interview. Um, they, were, they were great. It, it seems like, yeah, at least in the beginning, um, you know, it, it definitely got a lot of reaction. There were people that loved yeah. your message and other people that said, hey, it kind of it feels like you're blaming women yeah. for not being further. And you know, she, it, to paraphrase the thing she's saying, look, I'm not blaming women. I'm just saying, you know, we're part of the process of helping us get to where we want to be. Sitting on the sidelines and seeing your wife, you know, being criticized for for anything that she says. Well, what's just the process been like for you since the book came out? Yeah, it was. I mean, she was famous before, but now she's <laughs> yeah. now she's more famous than Mark. <laughs> no, well, I don't I don't know you about know. that, but 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 yeah, it was it was it was definitely hard to watch her get criticized before the book came out, and she wasn't really talking about it because she had sort of decided she was going to do all the stuff at the same time. And so she wasn't talking for about two weeks. And people were attacking her. And most of those people hadn't even read the book. So it was like, it, it was, and, and, and it was all women attacking her, by the way. No men attacked her. It was all women. Um, Why do you think that is? Um, I mean, she talks about it in her book. She actually wrote and said, I'm going to be attacked for the following things. And then people did exactly that. That's what I mean. It's like they weren't even self-aware enough to realize they should read what she wrote about how they were, she was going to be attacked. So it's, you know. But um, I think, you know, I think she says in the book, and, and she says that, you know, that... Um, be honest. Have you read it? <laughs> I've read it a few times. Okay. Um, that, you know, success and likability are... Are, uh, are, are, are positively correlated for men and negatively correlated for women. And... Um, Why? Why is that? Um, it has to do with a lot of just things that are cultural, things that we've grown up with. Um, she's got a story in the book that she talks about that there was this um, Harvard Business School case study um, and they gave the case study, half the class got it at, with the, the uh, protagonist's name is Howard and the other one is Heidi. Same case. And everyone got to the same results, except that everyone liked Howard and no one liked Heidi. Wow, that's interesting. Same, same case, literally same words, except for the names being changed. So there's something deeply kind of rooted in this sort of thing. Women are supposed to be nurturing, they're supposed to be caring, they're supposed to be emotional, and they're not supposed to be aggressive, they're not supposed to be assertive, they're not, you know, she talks about like one of the things she really wants to do is get rid of the word bossy. Right? How many times do you hear little girls called bossy? All the time. No one ever calls little boys. I, the thought had never occurred to me until she mentioned it. Um, and uh, you know, she likes to say we should say that your daughter has executive leadership skills. Um, <laughs> um, but it's true. It's true. It's like a. It's a negative. It's a negative thing, right? It's and we're we're putting down women who want to lead, and it starts at that very young age. Um, she has another story she talks about where. Um, some company, I don't remember which one it was, but a couple years ago put out um, t-shirts for infants. This is for infants, so it's not the kids. These are the parents buying these shirts. And the shirts say, smart like daddy, pretty like mommy. Right? And so we're starting with this bias, and then it just kind of, it grows over time. And so we've got to sort of get away from that. We need women to be leaders. We need we need more representation from women in leadership roles. And so I'm really, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really proud of her for taking on this thing. Like I said, she got attacked. She got attacked by a lot of people 
who are traditional feminists, to be honest with you. That's sort of who have, who have said, no, the problem is government. If government would solve our problems, everything would go away. And, you know, in some ways, that's sort of like waiting for Prince Charming. If only the government, you know, it's, it's a little bit of this fallacy of, and it's not to say that the government, there aren't governmental things, more better daycare, there aren't things we can do in government. And Cheryl says that very clearly in the book. But she also says there's uh, these other things that we also need to do. And we can do some of those ourselves today. And that's what she's saying. And, you know, she's saying that the men need to do more. Um, I think for any, for any of you that, that are men that have women working for you, one of the things that's really important in the book, Cheryl talks about, and this is, uh, you know, and by the way, women in your office are going to read the book. So you're going to want, if you're a man, you're going to want to read the book too because you want to understand um, what, wh all of a sudden, this sort of new language that's coming from the women who've read the book. And they're going to be asking for promotion that they should have asked for before but didn't. I talked to someone today. She said, I read the book. I went and asked for a promotion. And they gave it to me. And they said, of course. Why didn't you ask for it before? Right? Um, can, you, can you tell the story um, that you told on 60 Minutes? Because apparently everybody here is working too hard to watch TV, go team Los Angeles, <laughs> um, of what happened when Cheryl um, got the offer from Facebook and what your response was? Yeah, so my brother-in-law and I, she got the offer. She thought it was... So she was at Google. She was at Google. She was negotiating with Mark, and she had pretty much decided to take the job, and she was negotiating over, uh, over her comp and uh, her, her stock package. And she got the offer, and she was really excited. She's like, this is awesome, definitely doing this. And I was like, you absolutely cannot take this. She said, why? It's a great offer. I said, it doesn't matter. It's like, you, you, you can't do this. You, you're worth a lot more. And no, no guy would take the first offer they were given. They would always come back and negotiate. And you're going to be the COO of this company. Like, you're going to be negotiating. Like, it's, it just looks bad, if nothing else, not to, not to just negotiate. But, but, but more than that, you're worth a lot more. And you should go ask for it. And so um, she did, and she convinced Mark that she was A, worth more, and that B, that she needed to negotiate because she was negotiating for him. And so uh, she would have gotten there on her own, but I think, yeah, my brother-in-law and I sort of pushed her. Um, I think the sort of thing like a guy would never do this sort of pushed her into that, into that framework. Do you, how, how's your just day-to-day -day life? I mean, do you feel like in any way you lead a normal life? I mean, on the weekends you're probably, I mean, you're hanging out with pretty high-level, extraordinary people. You know, you, you started from pretty humble roots. You're yeah. here, where did you grow up here in L.A.? I know, I grew up in Minneapolis. Oh, Minneapolis. And then Minneapolis. when did you move to L.A.? Uh, 91, when I got the job at Capital. Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, I've lived in California more than anywhere else, but... I mean, uh, what's just your day-to-day -day yeah, life day -day like, life, and how do you, you know, balance yeah. work and you know, all these functions you have to go to and hanging out with Bono <laughs> and having princesses over at your house? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I mean, really, I mean, you were telling yeah, the story yeah, earlier, yeah, like, yeah. well, the princess of, you know, came I to mean, the house. It, and it, it, normal life is pretty normal. It's, I'm sure it's most, like most people's. I mean, we uh, spend a lot of time hanging out with our kids. We have, uh, you know, two young kids, and... Uh, and can I hire one of your children right now? Can I just <laughs> can they can I put an offer to they're six and eight, right? I mean yeah, do you, uh, uh, right now they're they can they can they have any position in the company they want. If, if, uh, they would by far be if you, smarter if you, than if you uh, need someone to do coloring or um, play uh, NBA two K a lot, we're we're all set. Um, but um, uh, you know, my, my, you know our, our life's pretty normal. Like, we try to get home. Cheryl, Cheryl got a lot of attention because before the book came out, she said she leaves at 5.30 every day. Um, but I leave at 5.30 every day, too. Uh, I, no one cares that I leave at 5.30. Uh, but um, but, uh, but, but we, we come home, we have dinner with our kids, um, and then you know, our kids go to bed around 8 o'clock, and then we get back online, and we work for a few hours, and we watch some TV. Like, it's not, I don't think it's different than most people's. What shows do you watch? What are your go-to shows? What's on, what's on your DVR? What's on your TiVo? Um, so I'm a music person. I, you know, um, I don't love all the storylines. Please but tell I, me, like, Kardashians no, on there. Just, like, no, no. some ridiculous thing but I, I, with you I, and Cheryl I, I, in between, I, I, like, Glee. figuring I'm, out I'm, how to I'm, make I'm, the world I'm better. I'm a Glee fan. I like Glee. Okay. I think his show is kind of sweet and sappy, but I love the music stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, Game of Thrones, Homeland. Solid. Yeah. Solid choice. Yeah. Yeah. As, as a brief reminder and as a favor, I'm going to ask everybody here. Um, we're launching a new product called ExpertCircle.com. The code to get in is ExpertCircle2013. It's on the codes here. I would love if you all could try it out. It's free. It's a recommendation engine of the best 
products and vendors you're going to have for your business. SurveyMonk's on there. I hope that you go in and submit your own products if you got them. And in a little bit when we break, uh, the first folks that go back there and sign up with it, we got a bunch of copies of Lean In. And we're going to give you a copy if you just go in, play around with the site for five minutes, register, and give us a little bit of feedback to see how we can make it better. The next event that we're doing is going to be on May 22nd. It's with Nivi, who's the co-founder of AngelList. Uh, so certainly if any of you, I know a lot of you are on the platform, are looking to join the platform. Um, he's awesome and did venture hacks before that. Um, and then we have the CEO of Odesk. We had the CEO uh, the following month in June, or June. Um, and then in July, we had the CEO of Get Satisfaction. Um, awesome. So we've got a good group that's, that, that's, that's following your lead here. Thank you. So um, just one of the things I wanted to say is, you know, you talked, Dave, about um, a lot of people helping you along the way and that kind of entrepreneurial ethos. And I've seen it since, you know, I've got to know you for a couple years now. And every time I have a question or anyone's needed help, people point to you as kind of an entrepreneur's entrepreneur, someone that's done it, always been in the arena to help it out. And I think tonight's an amazing example, coming down, taking some time, spending with us, you know, thank you for sharing about the story. Thank you for just being who you are and everything. And I just really wanted to say we're all so appreciative for having you here this evening. Oh, thank you. Um, so on that note, go grab a drink, hang out with us. We'll see you at the next event. Um, thank you for coming out, everybody. Thank you.